Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. And welcome to our first of three webinars. And today we're going to have in our Art Rising, we are going to have a conversation with a, a very notable uh, individual whose family represents an important pillar in the Malaysian art community. His name is Azmir Zain. And Azmir is currently a director of Gallery Z, an informal private art museum in Kuala Lumpur, which houses the Zain Azhari collection. So Zain Azhari, as you know, all know, is also known as Pat Zain, and he's one of the partners of Zain and Co, a prolific and a very dedicated art collector. The collection first started in 1962 and slowly grew in size over the subsequent decades and soon will celebrate its 60th anniversary. So of course, Azme grew up around Malaysian artworks from around the 60s and the 1970s and he now represents the next generation in his family that today manages the collection. He also sits on um, the board of the National Art Gallery since May 2020. So first of all, uh, Azmir, welcome to our little webinar today. Thank you for joining us. How are you doing? I'm well, thank you. Thanks very much, Izzy, for the very kind introduction. Uh, Assalamu alaikum and uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'd just like to firstly say that uh, our family, uh, Gallery Z and I, we are happy to be part of the CIMB October effort. Uh, we reckon initiatives like this uh, will give our local art scene uh, the prominence it richly deserves. Uh, so we're thrilled to be able to contribute um, in some way. Um, yeah, so as Izzy had pointed out, um, so the collection that our family uh, now mines, um, it started back in 1962. Um, so my father, um, Pazin, um, uh, so he uh, was born uh, in the mid-1930s. Um, so my father grew up uh, seeing his country being under the administration of the British colonial masters. Um, he had also lived and experienced World War II um, and the Japanese occupation. Um, and after that, the fight for independence um, and the communist insurgency uh, during the Blayan emergency of 48 to 1960, right? And it was, in Mal and the Malay of his youth uh, was one that was touched by colonialism, uh, war, uh, migration um, and, I, and I guess a strong desire to uh, to be independent if I could, if I could uh, put it that way. At the bottom right um, is a uh, so it's a photograph of the prefects board of uh, the Victoria Institution in 1953. There's my father standing at the back um, uh, fifth from right. Yeah so and after school um, he had uh, left for England and he was a law student uh, in London. So he spent three years uh, there uh, uh, completing his uh, uh, studies in law. Um, so England at the time, um, so it was mid 1950s, um, the British Empire was crumbling. Um, there were, uh, there were traces, so there were some traces of, uh, of World War II still um, in London. Um, Queen, Elizabeth, Queen E, Queen Elizabeth II had just been coron coronated. Uh, the way he explains it is that the atmosphere uh, in London and England at the time um, was one of renewal. People wanted to move on from the war. There was a, there was a new uh, head of state. And then uh, upon completing his studies, um, he returned back uh, to Malaya. Uh, so that was in 1958, uh, one year after Merdeka. Um, and the Malaya that he had um, returned to, uh, like I mentioned, was newly independent. Uh, people were feeling optimistic and were feeling, were feeling aspirational. Um, and the Malayan art scene um, similarly reflected that. Uh, in 1958 itself, uh, Tungku had launched the Balai Seni Negara. Um, he had opened uh, a, uh, his doors 
uh, in Jalan Ampang where the Matic building uh, today currently resides. Um, and then uh, Dewan Bahasa Pustaka um, uh, held a mural competition uh, where the winning entry would adorn the facade of uh, its building. And uh, that was won by a 17-year-old Ismail Mustaq. Um, and then with the Wednesday Art Group, which was probably um, the first um, art collective, I suppose, of its kind in Kuala Lumpur, um, where they were meeting weekly um, to meet and discuss and practice art uh, together. And their members included the likes of Ismail Mustam, Patrick Ng, Zulkifli Buyong, um, and also uh, quite tellingly, uh, I think, um, and you see the photograph on the uh, in the second row, uh, on the left hand side next to uh, next to Tungku. Um, those that's a photograph of some very very legendary figures in Malaysian art. The the trio of Latif Latif Moidin, Saima Jamal, Ibrahim Hussein. Um, uh, so they're all in that photograph. There's, there's also Jolly Ko um, and Anthony Lau as well. Uh, so those are grandmasters, right, um, of Malaysian art uh, today. I mean, one of the ways for 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 new enthusiasts, new collectors, to learn about art is, of course, um, and not just through the galleries and through books, but also through conversations and through uh, meeting up with uh, artists. Um, and by befriending these uh, artists, they will have a greater insight into what motivates. Uh, and what goes on in the minds of uh, uh, these guys. Um, in January 1962, uh, my parents got married. A former classmate of my father's had gifted my parents um, this um, small little artwork, uh, which you currently see on screen, <clears throat> which is a watercolour work by Syed Ahmad Jamal, by a young Syed Ahmad Jamal. Uh, it's a, and, and it's a rendition of uh, Batu Caves. So this work um, was is, is essentially the first uh, painting, the first artwork that had that came into the possession of our family. Um, and um, and uh, it is so if you, if you think about it, it is it is artwork number one. And then gradually over time. He gradually and very slowly acquired uh, more artworks and added more uh, works onto uh, the collection. Um, so uh, there, so if that, and he did so even from the 1960s itself, and he continued to do so in the 1970s. So um, if you were to have a look at what's on screen, uh, you can probably get a sense as to the mood at the time. Um, of of Malaya, those two of those two decades. Um, um, so there are works here which hit towards uh, Malaysia's rural and agricultural history, um, um, and you know people working being being very industrious, working working in the in the bendang, uh, selling satay, and then the piece in white uh, that's a very early piece from the 70s by a young Tajuddin Ismail. Uh, who has, of course, now gone on to become uh, someone uh, rather big, uh, you know, several decades on, right? Uh, sculptures started becoming a more prominent feature within uh, the collection, um, and then uh, mixed media uh, uh, started being uh, was also introduced by Fauzan Omar uh, into the Malaysian art scene. So, um, so arts in Malaysia were no longer just merely watercolors, oils, and acrylics. And uh, inevitably, during the Dr. Mahathir years of the 80s and 90s, uh, artworks of a political nature started to, started appearing uh, as well. Um, and the one on the bottom right, uh, one by by Anurendra, uh, is an example of such an artwork. Uh, so that particular one uh, was was painted in 1998. Uh, at the height of the uh, uh, the Re reformacy uh, movement, and then at the, at the turn of the century, um, we I guess the families uh, uh, still continued on to uh, acquire artworks, and uh, by the 2000s, I myself had returned uh, from uh, from tertiary education in, in England, 
Um, and, th- and it was only then I probably started becoming a little bit more involved um, in the family art collection. The art became a bit more, uh, started to appear more contemporary. Um, um, I suppose from today's eyes, um, there were more new materials. Um, I mean, just imagine, I mean, if you look at the, the, the work in the middle, um, uh, on the lower on the lower row, is the work by Nortijan, Nor- right? Uh, who uses e-waste, discarded electrical components. So you compare that, uh, which is a piece she created in 2017, to um, to say one of the pate pieces from from several pages ago. I mean, it really is like uh, night and day. Uh, art, the, the artworks we we were acquiring this last 20 years appeared but started to appear vastly different at least in form uh, to the ones uh, from the previous century the works i mean the, the works within the collection does reflect uh, the taste or, or yeah, and its evolution of a chap uh, who grew up in pre medeca days for my father uh, the art collection was in effect an assertion of nationhood for him um, so, um, you know, so he was someone who grew up during colonialism and saw all these various challenges which our country went through. So, um, um, so if you look, if you were to look at the artworks within our collection, it has all these features which kind of like remind him of 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 the earth in which the, the land on which he uh, lived on, the times in which he lived uh, lived in. It's in effect something related to to. To, to, to the concept of nationhood for him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, artists are the nation's biographers and, you know, almost historians, right? So they are they capture the images, energy and stories yeah. at that moment in time, yes. and, uh, which, which really forms this powerful uh, backdrop and backbone for, for the, for the uh, Zain Azhari collection. People who visitors who come to see our family uh, our gallery, um, I mean, they ask us uh, quite a number of questions, and uh, maybe it's worthwhile to share here as well um, some of the lessons we as a family had learned um, over the course of the previous decades uh, in terms of um, collecting art, or in terms of art and collecting art. And I guess the first one, um, which is probably worth certainly worthwhile saying here is that art can be enjoyed by anyone there is a certain uh, misconception that art is just for a certain type or for for just for the haves but it it really is not the case at all Um, if uh, you're a person who happens to like to see a pretty picture likes to see something that's visually pleasing you can most certainly like art. And I guess the other aspect to it uh, as well is that for something to constitute art, I mean, it need not be something so mysterious or so cryptic, right? Uh, so even like something like uh, the painting on the screen. Um, um, so this is a piece by Zuzila Zain, 1996. It's a piece of naive art depict, uh, you know, from uh, uh, created from from pen and ink and a little bit of watercolor, uh, and it's just a simple kampung scene. And this is a artwork which my family and I uh, fight over. You know, for, to who you know who gets to hang it at, at whose home. Uh, and in fact, the National Art Gallery Balas Ni Negara, I mean, collects works by Zuzila which look like this. The second thing that uh, uh, a second lesson learned for for us as a family is worthwhile sharing is that artworks uh, they can be viewed uh, they can be appreciated in more than one way and by that i mean that you could appreciate an artwork you know, just for being pretty just for its uh, aesthetic quality that's one you could also appreciate it for its technical qualities uh, for something uh, for appreciating it as something that's difficult to produce uh, and i guess the third thing a third way to appreciate an artwork um, is the narrative or the story behind uh, the artwork, and and maybe if I could use this uh, the artwork is currently on screen uh, to illustrate that. Um, so this is a piece called Alamanda uh, by Ganchin Lee, uh, which we acquired uh, well, five six years ago. 
um, and uh, and at one level, I mean, we reckon is actually a nice picture, right? Um, there is nice yellow flowers um, with a nice blue on the side and nice uh, hue of red uh, with the elderly couple looking outwards. It's an impressive work and it's actually nice to see. The other way of looking at this painting is to start attempting to interpret it. And what this painting is actually about uh, it is, um, is, is actually uh, uh, relaying the story of the new villages which were created under the BRICS plan during the Malayan emergency uh, 70 years ago uh, in the 1950s. So uh, one of the steps which the British took to counter the communist insurgency uh, in Malaya at the time was to uh, separate who they suspected were sympathizers of the communists and um, and the profile that fit that uh, were usually the uh, people who were, of, uh, uh, were, were the Chinese who lived uh, in the rural areas. So the British created um, what they call new villages so that they separated these uh, they separated the, the so-called sympathizers uh, from the communist guerrillas um, um, so that they would essentially uh, cut out the supply of food uh, potential money and potentially recruits and so on um, and then something which we are also asked uh, from uh, time to time is um, I mean what would be a recommended approach to uh, to building a collection, um, so like I mentioned, uh, the approach our fam like our family has has done uh, all this well is quite open ended. So uh, the criteria is what essentially looks nice to our eyes. I think that um, and it's something if it's something which we can afford and yeah, uh, um, we'll be interested. Uh, so that will be an approach which I kind of like try to capture on that on the left hand side um, and then to the right um, another way of approaching uh, a collect, uh, a coll uh, towards building a collection is to focus on several artists um, so um, you could do your research read up look at look at the galleries um, see what others who others are collecting get a sense as to what you like uh, which artists um, uh, which five or six artists um, you um, uh, you actually enjoy seeing, or in fact enjoy yeah. making friends with, even, and just collect their works. You just focus on their works, um, and over time, just build a collection, uh, uh, you know, centering on those number of just those handful of artists. Uh, another approach going further down the right is that you maybe is to collect works of a certain type. Um, so you, so I'm here. I'm illustrating using sculptures as an illustration. So rather than paintings, um, you may instead uh, prefer the three-dimensionality of uh, sculptures, and that perhaps is something which you prefer uh, to invest into, to go into, um, uh, or you or you could um, um, equally uh, collect only landscapes, only portraits and figures. Uh, uh, that's another uh, approach. And another approach, uh, maybe not necessarily purist, but certainly not wrong, is to acquire based on what looks good uh, in, uh, in your home. Um, so take for example, if you've decided that uh, green looks good on your walls, so you would acquire artworks which have an uh, and a, a green tinge in it, uh, such as those on the uh, on the right hand side of the screen. The art the art collection needs to serve you uh, rather than the other way around. Yeah. So so I guess we are also asked quite a bit about um, art as an investment. Um, now I guess probably it's probably I should set out up front that I mean my family doesn't actually view art um, as an you know, artworks as an investment, as an as an, as an asset class uh, for investment. Um, but I imagine that um, just like other asset classes, I mean, the likelihood of artworks increasing in value 
uh, at a later date, I mean, it's dependent on the intrinsic quality uh, of uh, the artwork. Um, so, think of things, things such as the reputation of the artists, the technical quality of the work, its condition, um, whether it has historical significance, things like that. But uh, we'd imagine that um, if if someone were to look at uh, acquiring artworks uh, with an investment purpose, um, they may end up acquiring works which they may not necessarily uh, enjoy looking at on their walls. Um, it may not be something that's necessarily um, be aesthetically pleasing to them um, um, uh, because their main criteria for acquiring artworks uh, uh, I mean it's not it's not for personal satisfaction but more for investment yeah I, but I think to the to the maybe to the uh, new collectors or those who are sort of like considering uh, you know becoming a collector I think we uh, first of all the the, the art pieces do uh, contain value uh, and in our ecosystem uh, does have uh, a secondary market right so in case they want to monetize their their paintings or their artworks but I think you're right um, approaching uh, collecting uh, purely for the purpose of investment will probably not generate the pleasure uh, as compared to uh, buying it uh, because you want to build, um, you know, the, where, where the decision process is is uh, based on your, on your, uh, on your, you know, gut feel, a combination of um, and and things like that, right? So um, it becomes a different, uh, different ball game, right? Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, our gallery periodically publishes books, um, so we actually published before. Um, books which contains images of the works um, within our collection uh, right up to 2018. So those, those are books on left hand side. Uh, so you can actually acquire them uh, at our gallery or even at Kinokunia. Um, and then we are also going to publish a new book. Um, and this book is in commemoration of my parents' 60th wedding anniversary uh, in January of next year. Uh, which of course also coincides with the 60th anniversary of the inception of the collection. Uh, so it's called A Glimpse of Major in 60 Artworks. So we've selected 60 artworks from the collection uh, from 60 different artists. Um, um, and there's some there's a brief essay accompanying each work and that's contained in this um, uh, book. Okay, so... Um, now, this is the last uh, slide in, uh, in this presentation. Um, so, uh, as a final word, so to speak. Now, this artwork, um, which is a Pago Pago, uh, it was part of uh, by Latif Muhyiddin. Um, it was painted in 1965. Um, so, this painting, probably more than any other in the entire collection, uh, probably encapsulates the journey that my father has gone through uh, in art and art collection uh, in, in, in art collecting in the last 60 years. Uh, so this is probably the painting that represents that experience more than any other. Um, so he acquired this work um, um, in, in an exhibition in KL uh, in the in the mid 1960s, uh, and at that point of time, um, Latif uh, had just returned from Berlin from his fine art studies um, just several ways, just several years before, um, and he had created the Pago Pago series of works, uh, which turned out to be um, this breath of fresh air, this groundbreaking uh, piece of Malaysian art that moved. Um, the art scene here from its typical portraits, you know, real life portraits and uh, home scenes and so on. So this was the series that moved Malayan art away from that. Uh, this artwork was displayed at the Museum of European Modern Art at the Centre Pompidou in Paris. And it was the first uh, artist from Southeast Asia to, whose works were displayed um, at that um, museum. So. Um, as a consequence, this art, this 
piece has become you know quite a valuable piece uh, for us. Um, I mean, it's, it's a word that he he saved money for, skipped meals for, in in all likelihood, um, just to pay 150 ringgit um, to to get his hands on this. And yeah, I mean, and literally half a century later, it's become this thing that's been displayed um, um, in Paris, right? In the in the sense. Of- Thank you, Asmi, for that wonderful. Um- presentation um maybe as a uh, as a, as a closing right um uh, one final question for you uh how do we push the malaysian art movement uh to make it more uh ex- you know more more exciting or more uh, uh more sought after uh more well known i mean we all would like to see this being pushed to uh, another level, right? The the main thing that comes to mind is to make art more accessible. Um, so by that I mean uh, by having initiatives such as CIMB October. Um, and I'm not saying this because you guys have invited us to uh, speak on this. Um, but but initiatives like this uh, that will help attract to pull and draw uh, uh, new audiences um, to um, to the art scene here. Um, because at the end of the day, um, the vibrancy of the of the um, of of the art here it is it is a function of in, in a sense it is a function of demand and supply um, and um, creating and and I think the government has already put in place quite a number of initiatives to develop the supply side um, but I think more needs to be done to help push along to develop uh, the demand side of things and uh, something like October uh, is is I think is one such initiative and I guess if I could add to that um, as a corollary to that um, um, today uh, there is perhaps one um, public uh, museum, uh, the, uh, the Balai Seni Negara, the National Art Gallery, uh, and it does house um, probably the most iconic works of art of the 20th century in Malaysia. Um, but the works of art, uh, the best pieces of art of the 21st century, I think, are actually in private hands. Uh, and the reason that's that's the case is because there are more collectors now, and private collectors are able to take decisions far quicker than. <laughs> Then Balai Seni Negara, which is a government entity, right? Um, and if there is some some way uh, we could, um, we I mean, there could be some effort towards being able to display those uh, iconic 21st century works, Malaysian works, uh, to the public to make it more accessible. I think that would help as well. That would be wonderful, yeah, to get them and 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 kind of see the kind of critical thinking and the, the just the amazing talent uh, of our local artists. Thank Absolutely. you very much, Azmir. Uh, I'm Ismail from CIMB and I'd like to thank my guest for today, Azmir, for sharing with us, uh, giving you just a sneak preview, and I can uh, attest to that, of this amazing collection that his father uh, had started 60 years ago. So with that, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us. And thank you, Azmir, from all of us. See you, Amiyatu. Thank you.